It is customary that the newly ordained priest does not preach at his first Mass. And so being Matthew's uncle, I was asked to preach his first Mass. And I think it's not because I'm some sort of wonderful preacher. It's just that he knows that after I'm done preaching, anyone who sits through his homilies will go, wow, he's not as long as his uncle. <laughs> after listening to Matthew preach the past few days as a deacon, it came to mind there's a difference between a preacher and a helicopter pilot. A uh, preacher and a, and a, and a homilist, I'm sorry. A homilist is a helicopter pilot. He flies, he takes off, he lands. A preacher is an airline pilot. You need a long runway, you got to get up to flying altitude, you got to cross the Atlantic, circle a few times. Matthew, you're a helicopter pilot. I'm still flying the airline. <laughs> 24 years ago, I was ordained a priest, and my brother-in-law made my chalice. He would carve it out in the basement on a lathe, and it would spin, and Matthew was Father Matthew, Father Matthew, was two years old, and he would sit on the basement steps, and he'd watch the chalice spin. And he'd whisper, Uncle Mikey's chalice goes round, 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 as it spun and it was carved out. Well, when it came time for my first Mass, and I blessed the chalice of my first Mass, and I'm saying the words of consecration, you're so nervous at your first Mass, and I hold up the Eucharist, and I'm shaking inside, and then I hold up the chalice. And a two-year-old screams out, I'll go back in chalice! <laughs> if you happen to hear some screaming during consecration, it's revenge. <laughs> now, Matthew will be a very, very Father Matthew, a very fine priest, who is a man who truly has the depth of faith to be the priest that God wants him to be. And I really like to tell you a story about a woman by the name of Catherine Doherty who founded a place called Madonna House. It was a place where people would be formed to uh, go out and to work with the poor. And she grew up in Russia, this woman, Catherine Doherty. And when she was growing up in Russia, she was a little girl and they were coming home. And her and her mother saw the priest lying in the gutter, drunk. And so they took the priest home, the mother put the priest to bed, they got back to the house, and Catherine's mother said to her, Catherine, go take the flowers out of the vase. And so she took the flowers out of the vase. She said, Catherine, arrange the flowers in the toilet. Thought it was odd, but she dutifully arranged the flowers in the toilet. And her mother said to her, Catherine, are the flowers any less beautiful in the toilet than they were in the vase? She said, no, mommy, the flowers are still beautiful. And her mother said to her, that's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. No matter who the man is, his priesthood is always beautiful. His priesthood is always beautiful. Some of us are vases, some of us are toilets. But the fact remains that the priesthood is always beautiful. The priesthood is beautiful because God gave it to the world. God gave the priesthood as a means by which He might communicate divine life to the world. It's the way that God chose to create these vehicles, these bridges by which He might be able to send grace to souls by which he might bring children to the adoption of the children of God, by which you and I may come to eat of the bread of life as he announced today in the Scriptures, the avenue by which you and I might have our sins forgiven, be wed and receive that sacrament before we go home to the glory of God. It was God who designed the holy priesthood to be what it is so that His grace, His love, His mercy, His goodness, His beauty may continue to flow upon this world. Not all of us are always the best at it, but even the worst of priests and the worst of sins, celebrating the sacraments with the intention of the church, cannot stop the merciful love of God flowing into the world. You see, a priest truly is a bridge. 
A priest stands on earth with his feet firmly planted on the earth. And with his hands, the priest grabs the throne of God and lays himself down between the chasm between heaven and earth. You see, when Moses was interceding for the people, he stood at the chasm. And there was a chasm between he and God, and he pleaded for God's mercy on his people. We priests, we lay our lives down. We lay ourselves over that chasm. We grab the throne of heaven with our hands, with our feet firmly planted upon the earth. And it is on our backs that God comes to you and you come to God. For man to become a priest, for man to give himself in this manner, to be that bridge to God, it costs everything. And there was some priest in the video I heard say, it's worth it all. You must lay down your lives to be that bridge to be a priest. To be a priest of Jesus Christ. Because it's going to require of you everything of who you are. It requires a man to love the Lord his God with his whole heart, with his whole mind, with all of his strength. He must give himself completely, limitlessly, unreservedly to the Lord. That's why the vow of celibacy. Because Christ and the people of God must be his first and only love. As a man loves a woman and must give himself completely to her in marriage, give himself a hundred percent and lay down his life for her, so a man called to be a priest steps up, weds himself to the church as Christ did, and gives himself one hundred percent as an act of love to his new bride, the church, and loves her with everything of his being. A priest is truly a husband. A man who is wedded to the church, his vow of celibacy is his vow to give himself completely, unreservedly, limitlessly, unconditionally to the people of God, holding back nothing of himself or for himself. And so a priest truly becomes, as Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, not his own. Yesterday when Matthew knelt before the bishop and the bishop laid his hands on Father Matthew's head, he was no longer his own. He no longer even belongs to himself. He belongs to God and he belongs to you. And you have a right to the sacrament that he has now the authority to confect. It will be upon his back that your children will come to become children of God through the waters of baptism as you carry that child to God and God adopts that child as his own in the waters of baptism and brought into the order of grace. It's upon his back that you and I today will receive Holy Communion as he offers the Holy Sacrifice to the Mass, receives our Lord, gives you Communion. It's through him that you will come to God and Jesus will come to you in the Holy Eucharist. It's on His back that you'll be strengthened in the sacrament of confirmation. And He will be the bridge at that moment when you are dying or sick. And He will come to you and bring to you the saving power of our Lord and the gift of the anointing of the sick, particularly at the moment of death. Father Matthew asked me what was my favorite sacrament to celebrate. And usually it's baptism, because you never know what's going to happen at a baptism. Like yesterday, Friday, when he baptized uh, my great nephew, he went to do the prayer over him, and instead of uh, just being quiet, the kid gave him a high five. <laughs> These things happen. They're fun. But one of the other great sacraments is anointing of the sick, because... When people are dying, they never say, get me the rabbi, or get me the Protestant minister. When somebody is dying, only the priest has authority. The priest carries with him the keys to that kingdom. The priest can go into that person's room, absolve them of their sins, anoint them and give them the strength to die in the grace of God, can even remit their purgatory time. 
The priest opens the door to heaven, escorts the soul in, and shuts it behind them. Whenever I'm in that situation and all this is done, I always say to the person now, when you get to heaven, remember, Father David got you here. Pray for me when you get there. Don't forget me. You know, you get 10% fine to see. The priest has such a beautiful gift. And it's the only sacrament that's given, not for the person who receives it. You were baptized for you. I was baptized for me. We were baptized so that we could become children of God, have original sin washed from our soul, receive the state of grace, and so forth. We receive communion for ourselves that we might grow in unity with God. We receive confirmation for ourselves to be strong. Sacrament of matrimony is received for the two people who receive it to be truly one. Sacrament of anointing of the sick is given to that person that that person may be strengthened and so forth. And with the sacrament of the priesthood, is the only one of the seven sacraments not given for the person who received it. Father Matthew, you were not ordained a priest for you. You can't hear your own confession. Don't try. Don't look in the mirror and say, forgive me, Father Matthew, for I have sinned. Oh, pray for Hail Mary. Can't do it. You can't anoint yourself. You need another priest to anoint you. Once a year on your anniversary, you can say Mass for your intention, but for a priest, you don't even really think too often of your own intentions. You think of the intentions of the people. You're not ordained for you. You're ordained for them. It's the one sacrament given for the sake of God's people, not for the one who receives it. Which is why a priest cannot hold back anything of himself or for himself, but must give himself totally, totally, unreservedly, limitlessly, unconditionally to the people of God. Only you, as a priest, can absolve their sins. By the way, he did practice the formula of absolution. You know, I absolve you from your sins. That didn't count. Um, so he's got it down. He can't tell you this because everything's locked in the still, but I can tell you, he heard his first confession this morning, so I can tell you that. I'll, I'll ta- ask the penitent how he did later, but he can't tell you anything about it. But you have that grace, you have that gift, and only you as a priest can unlock them out of the prison of sin. You alone, by the authority given to you by Jesus Christ, through the hands of Bishop Sticker, you have the authority to absolve the worst, most horrible sins committed. You have that authority. Don't be stingy with that gift. You have the authority and the gift to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass, to transubstantiate bread and wine into the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and offer Jesus to the Father for the sake of the people. Don't go a day without celebrating the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Because in that gift, you draw down grace and you're the only one able to do that among your brother priests. Don't be stingy with that gift. That when someone's sick in the hospital and needs the anointing, someone's dying. It doesn't matter what time of night, it doesn't matter what time of day, it doesn't matter how tired you are, how exhausted you are, you get in that car and you get there because you have the keys to unlock the kingdom of heaven for them. And you are the ones to do it when you get that call. It's a self-sacrificing life, the priest. Because not only are we ordained priests, but we're also victims, as Jesus is both priest and victim. As Jesus offered the sacrifice, he offered the sacrifice of himself, and so we as priests offer the sacrifice of ourselves in union with Christ. Your time is no longer your time. Your life is no longer your life. Their time, their life. It's not about your needs, it's their needs. Because you are a priest of Jesus Christ. To close out this homily, I'm going to give you four points to remember. 
when you celebrate any of the sacraments, particularly the Holy Mass, if you always wish to celebrate a reverent, good Holy Mass, four simple points. Who are you? Where are you? What are you doing? And who are you talking to? Never forget who you are. Never forget that you are a priest of Jesus Christ. When you start walking down that aisle, remember you are going to stand in persona Christi. You are speaking to God the Father as God the Son. When you're in that confessional, you are in persona Christi. You are absolving sins in the person of Christ. When you are anointing, baptizing. Who are you? You are the Son of God, and yet you are also standing in the second person of the Trinity, speaking to the God, the Father, as His only begotten from all of eternity. Where are you? When you're here in the sanctuary, you're in the Holy of Holies. You're in the sanctuary of the Most High. When you're in that confessional, you are in the heart of Christ dispensing His mercy upon souls. When you are at the bedside of someone dying, you are at the gate of the kingdom of heaven. When you are baptizing a soul, you are at the womb of the church bringing that child to life. Who are you? Where are you? What are you doing? Never forget what you're doing at this holy altar. You're not just selling, saying Mass. You're not just celebrating Mass. You are offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass. You are offering the sacrifice of the Son to the Father as the Son in persona Christi. When you're hearing confessions, you are absolving sins and you're cleansing these souls. When you're baptizing, you're bringing a child to life. Who are you? Where are you? What are you doing? And who are you talking to? When you're celebrating the Holy Mass, you're talking to God the Father as His Son. When you speak to the people, speak to the people, like the words of the Lord be with you and so forth. But when you're celebrating the Mass, you're speaking to the Father. Speak to the Father. When you're absolving, you're speaking to that person in persona Christi. Always remember who are you, where are you, what you're doing, and who you're talking to. And never forget, I guess it's five things. I always have something else to say. We're almost done. Hang on. Now you're going to know why I'm the airline pilot and he's the helicopter pilot. Wait till next week and he's just, you know, done. The word before your name now is no longer deacon or mister or reverend mister. You're not a minister who simply ministers the mysteries of God. You're a father. The priesthood is truly a fatherhood. You will bring souls to life through the sacrament of baptism just as the Father gives life. But the life you give will be divine life. Secondly, you will feed your children with the Eucharist just as the Father feeds his family. When you get the opportunity to celebrate the sacrament of confirmation, you'll be strengthening your children just as the Father strengthens his family and protects his family. You will be a teacher of truth from this pulpit, just as the Father instructs, so you will instruct. You will correct your children through the sacrament of confession, just as the Father corrects. You will wed your children in the sacrament of matrimony. And you'll rejoice that day, this child you may have baptized is now being married and rejoice with that. And you will also be one who will assist your children home to the glory of heaven. Father Matthew. Never forget the word Father. Oh, there was a sixth thing. Remember, I'm the family priest, not you. Well, I'm the archpriest now, so you, you can't do anything without my permission. No weddings, no baptisms, it's the family, so I'm the archpriest now. Anyway, <laughs> never forget the word Father. You're no longer Matthew Donahue. You are Father Matthew Donahue. You are a priest of Jesus Christ. You belong to Him, and they need you to be priest to them, a father to them. Love them with the Father's heart. May God bless you, and Mary keep you.